Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, thank you for Blue Water Cruising Association for hosting this event. I'm just we're going to recap before we start looking at each of these individual di devices again, and not this time looking at why you need one or how you should buy one, but looking at how you should troubleshoot it if you do have one. So we're going to be looking at chargers, alternators, solar panel and controllers, fuel cells, battery isolators, battery combiners, AC DC generators, and we're even going to be looking at a Gavilank isolators as well. I want to emphasize this, this is so important everyone here, the magic of unswitched versus switched distribution is going to give you a lot of grief on your boat and I, I've got bad news. Bad news is most of you have a wire that should be unswitched on the switch and a wire that should be on the switch is unswitched. And that's not going to manifest itself until you turn a battery switch off or something that you would expect doesn't. So you, you need a, some sort of a failure. Everything's working, but then you turn something on and they still work. And you're like, what the hell? And so this is an incredibly important concept. We were on a boat last week, a uh, battery combiner on a really nice boat, you know, 40 foot sailboat, pretty expensive sailboat. You know, not it's, it's production, but it's a very expensive production boat. And someone had installed the battery combiner, and the battery combiner was installed on the switch side. And that means that you could turn the battery switches off, and if the battery charger was on, the house loads were actually powered from the engine battery via the battery charger. And all this magic happens when things aren't correct. So that's what we're going to be looking at right now, is we're going to look at each of those, and I'm going to share with you the lessons that I've learned from working on all of your boats and going to be sharing the common knowledge of troubleshooting. I would say troubleshooting is probably of my weekly life, I work about maybe 70, I'd say I do about 25 hours of troubleshooting over the phone. 25 hours of my life is, it gets to me and then people need help and I walk them through over the phone. And so, and that's not what the technicians do, they do troubleshooting on their own and then collectively all that information gets shared amongst all of us because we find cool things or things that are weird we find interesting and then we ended up sharing with one another and so with that I'm gonna get started question is how do you basically know where my switch distribution is and the likelihood is you unswitch most likely it's not named and it's not somewhere most what happens on a lot of boats to be honest it's going to be, you're going to see if you've got, for example, a Beneteau boat, they're going to have stacked about 20 connections on the positive side of that battery connection right there. You'll see them, you'll see them, you look at them, and there's literally that amount of connections on the back side of a battery switch. Because they're, it's one connection at a time. The uns, even the switch distribution, in a lot of cases, doesn't exist. It's a post, or it's the battery switch itself, and they're going to stack a bunch of connections on there. It's hard. It's hard. That's the problem. It's really hard. People take shortcuts. Now, if you had a brand new, let's say, for example, North Pacific or a brand new Grand Banks, uh, you've got a Fleming, I don't know, you've got a Swan or, you know, a high-end boat or even a trawler like an um, American Tug, a Nordic Tug, yeah, you're going to be able to find this. But if it's sort of an older boat, they didn't, they're basically saying, well, isn't the battery post here the same as this? And, well, it's above the code, I shouldn't have more than four, but does it really matter if I have six? And then you'll have six or seven or eight connections on the top of a battery post. And they're trying to cut corners because that buzz bar there costs over 150 bucks. So they're trying to remove it. And they're trying to remove this one because that's also $150. So if they don't have to install it, it's $300 they can save. And so they start jerry-rigging. And that's the problem is, this stuff needs to exist, it's certainly on my boat. When I work on a boat, I can guarantee it's on the boat. But is it on everybody's boat? The short answer is probably not. You're going to need to sort of understand, oh, that's the unswitch distribution because I always have power on that post. It's almost like having it connected directly to the battery, but not at the battery. So the short answer is it's really hard to tell. Okay, question? Fuse blocks, should they be switch or unswitch? It really depends on what is connected to the fuse block. Yesterday we talked about this concept that bilge pumps should be unswitched, right? Carbon monoxide detector, unswitched. 
radio memory, unswitched. Now what is a connection that could be connected there? You could have here, for example, a VHF radio, not a VHF, let's do another one. VHF could, is actually should be unswitched. It could be anything, it could be a downrigger. You know, you have a boat with a downrigger, you don't have an on-off circuit breaker at the panel, and that connection is gonna simply be unswitched, it's gonna be a switched connection at a fuse block that you only turn the downrigger when the downrigger is actually connected. Because the challenge is, a lot of us have way more circuits than circuit breakers. Remember I was joking earlier that the circuit breaker on my boat, on my Catalina 36, should be like a household fridge door? Well, I probably have, no joke, probably 80 circuits on my boat, and my panel has only 24 circuits on it. So how is it that I have, well then I say, well I might not turn the fan at the DC panel, the fan is going to be turned on at the fan. So I don't turn on the fan at the panel and then turn on the fan at the fan. I simply connect it at a fuse block and the fan has a switch that's on and off. And so my fan is always energized as long as this switch is energized. And that's how I do it. And that fuse block is on an external wall that you can get out. Yeah, the question, is, you're right, the, where is my fuse block? The fuse block could be hidden behind a DC panel, it could be hidden under somewhere, like you <laughs> drop down, it could be in a cubby, you know, it could be a place that's not obviously super visible, but visible enough and accessible enough. No problem. So we do design. That's a big part of what we do. I mean, collectively, our company does about 200 designs a year of boats I'll never work on physically. Some of the clients are in South America, Malaysia, Saudi Arabia, Abu Dhabi, uh, Middle East. Uh, they're everywhere around the world. Every probably state in the states, Kentucky, Alabama, Louisiana, Missouri, New Jersey, like I've, there's designs going to all these different places. We do electrical design. It's a huge part of our business now. It's, it's about 20% of our business is just creating schematics for owners around the world where we just give, like an architect, I, here you go, built. You know, you can build it yourself, you can have someone else build it, but where we're really just being sort of like an engineer, you just give them plans and you can build to that plan. So yeah, we definitely do that. We're launching on our website, and I've been wanting to do it, but I don't have the time, sort of different uh, sort of testimonials. And some of the schematics, literally on big boats, like the you know, 100 footers or 150 footers, you know, it's this thick. It's you know, 200 pages of design after design after design, and the pages are like this big. You know, it's crazy, so it depends. But my boat, I understand what you want. I, unfortunately, that I'm not ready. But yes, we do. We do. We'll have samples of typical designs going on our website. I just haven't come to the time to do that yet. Okay. Any other questions before we move forward? All good. All right. Excellent. Okay. We're going to start with something that everyone should have on their boat. Anybody want to take a guess at what the next thing that everyone has on their boat that's on this slide? Anybody has an idea? What's a popular item on this side that pretty much everyone should have on their boat? Alternator. Alternator is a good one. Charger. We're going to start with a charger. If you don't have a charger on your boat, you're pretty lucky. That means that you don't have any loads on your boat. Most of us, a show of hands of anybody here in the class that doesn't have a battery charger on their boat. Everybody has a battery charger. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, everybody has a charger. It's pretty rare to have an alternator only boat right, where you have no other means of charging your boat other than an alternator. That's pretty rare, pretty rare. Right. <laughs> okay, so what can go wrong here, right? So you gotta remember, what did we say at the beginning? We said you start at the beginning. And the beginning for a battery charger is not the batteries, it's the power that feeds the battery charger, right? So the first step you gotta ask yourself is, my battery charger will never work unless I have AC on board, and AC can come from shore power, or it can come from a generator, right? But if you're not connected to shore power, and or you're not running a generator, don't look further for wondering why your battery charger doesn't work, and I know it sounds like a silly question, but I get that all the time. There are people who are out on an anchorage, their battery charger literally not connected to shore power, and they're wondering why their battery charger doesn't work. Because it sounds silly, but it isn't. A lot of people think that battery chargers are powered by an alternator or their engine, and they aren't. Battery chargers take AC in to create DC. So without AC, you can't get a battery charger to work. Now, you could have AC coming into the panel, 
And another thing I mentioned, and how often did I mention this, this concept of turning on the circuit breaker. I was on a boat last week, maybe two weeks ago, on a 60-footer. Sure enough, again, panel's pretty intimidating. Lots of breakers on the panel. Lots and lots of breakers. And guess what? The owner did not know that there was a battery. It didn't say battery charger. It said converter. And the owner like, what's a converter? Turned it off. The batteries were dead. Why? Didn't know that converter was AKA battery charger. And relatively, this happens to all of us as boaters when we get not a new boat, but a new boat to us. The learning curve for getting a boat is measured in years, not months. If you think you know your boat after a few months, <laughs> it's, I tell people, you're like, two years? I'm like, oh no, you're, you're, you're still on the journey. Like, it's going to take you about five years to really know her. And then you're going to be like, yeah, I think I got it. And that's if you're involved and you really are into it. If you're sort of on the peripheral and you don't boat, you'll never get to know your boat. Never. So breaker, and what you want to do is turn the breaker off, turn the breaker on, see a change. Are the lights lighting up on the charger? There's always a, some sort of indicator light on a battery charger, right? There's always something saying, this is on. Either the needle's going to go up, there's going to be a bunch of bulbs that are going to light up, LEDs. Something is going to tell you that this thing is energized, right? And if you're turning on the breaker on and off and you, it always looks dead, then you know that either the device has failed or the breaker that feeds this device has failed. And most likely, breakers don't rarely fail. If you've got power, AC power at the panel, you turn on the breaker, that little LED light turns on, and then you don't have power here and this thing doesn't light up, it's dead. Now, you know what? How many times a year do I get a call from someone that had water damage in the engine room, a water pump failed, Water was literally spraying everywhere in the engine room. And what did they do? They simply wiped things with a rag. Two months later, a month later, their charger dies. I'm like, did you have water down in your engine room? Nope. Any flooding? Nope. Well, we did have a water pump that failed. There's a lot of salt water that went everywhere. I'm like, is the charger nearby? Yeah, it got wet, but it wasn't immersed. I'm like, yeah, but it's a piece of electronic equipment. And this thing is not waterproof in any world and these buttons can't have any water go to them and you probably have corrosion and more often than not the battery charger will die it's generally sometimes it's going to be because of water damage not literally being immersed but simply because of a water pump failing in an engine room and spraying salt water everywhere you got to be able to see some sort of light turn on to this device if it's dead dead don't keep going now the next thing you need to worry about is these fuses right here and right here. Now, on most cases, you won't have a fuse because people don't read the manual, right? But if your installation is done right, you're gonna have a fuse on the circuit. And sometimes, remember this, fuses are not just on off, there's some that are resettable, they're thermal circuit breakers. I was another boat just recently, another call out, and someone did understand what a thermal circuit breaker was and they push a button, nothing happened, they assumed everything was working and they had turned off the circuit breaker, right? And it was basically now disabling the battery charger to the engine battery. So just by press, bringing the lever back on, re-enabling the thermal circuit breaker, now allowed the engine battery to be energized, okay? So you gotta make sure that that fuse is intact now, if you're curious to see and you don't know, one of the ways to measure that would be disconnect your shore power breaker or your inverter charger not the, or generator and measure voltage at the battery charger. There's going to be a positive and negative post. And if you take something like this, a multimeter, and I brought a bunch because last year I didn't, for anybody who wants to buy one, bought a, brought a bunch this year. If you've got a multimeter on your boat, you're going to take a digital multimeter and then what you're going to do is you're going to put the positive and negative connections at the bottom of the charger, which on this charger are right here. And then you're going to measure for a voltage. And you're going to want to measure the same voltage you measure at the battery. And if you measure 12.6 here and your battery's 12.6 and you're not connected to AC, the only way that your charger sees 12.6 is if it's connected to a battery. Right? It demonstrates that you have circuit integrity between the battery and the charger. And that's one way to do it on a big boat, 
Sometimes you're like, well, I don't know where the fuse would be. I have no idea. Is there a fuse? I don't know. I didn't install the charger. And so you do that by measuring voltage right at the battery charger. Okay? Another thing that happens is people say to me, they say, Jeff, my battery charger is overcharging my batteries. I'm like, okay, how do you know? They're like, well, Jeff, it's charging. It's 14.8 volts. My batteries, it's bulk, it's absorption charging at 14.8. It should only be at 14.4. I'm like, okay, how do you know it's 14.4? Well, AGM should be 14.4. I'm like, great. Do you have a temperature sensor? And they're like, yeah, I've got a temperature sensor. Is it connected? Yeah. How cold is it in your engine room? They're like, well, you know, it's maybe 55 degrees, 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Sure enough, the temperature sensor is connected to the battery, and if the battery is cold, we talked about that yesterday, that device is going to charge higher than normal, right? Because all the numbers that we have in our head of what is a normal battery voltage are always at 77 degrees Fahrenheit. So if it's warmer than 77 degrees Fahrenheit, the voltages are going to go lower. If it's colder than 77 degrees Fahrenheit, the voltages are going to go higher. So you, I see sometimes battery chargers outputting 15.1, 15.2. It's not that they're damaged, it's that they're temperature compensating for a very cold battery. And in the summer, when our batteries are in a boat surrounded by water that's really warm, again, the battery charger will never get to 14.4, it might only get to 14.1 or 14. Because the batteries are so hot, they're temperature compensating down. Again, that's a common one. Jeff, my batteries are not charging adequately. I'm undercharging my batteries. It never got to 14.4. I'm like, yes, but we're in the middle of summer. Where is your boat? Are you on the outside of Vancouver Island, let's say, where the water is only 50 degrees Fahrenheit? Or are you in a place where the water is 75 degrees Fahrenheit in the summer and it's 100 degrees outside or 90 degrees outside? Well, yes, of course. Your batteries are warmer than 77 degrees Fahrenheit. And if your batteries are in an engine room or an engine compartment that gets hot underway and you're running a generator, let's say, well, they're going to be actually charging at less of a voltage, okay? Now, can't emphasize this enough. If your battery charger, and this is a great test, every one of us should do this on their boat. You should disconnect all your battery switches on your boat. You should have your boat disconnected from shore, shore power with a voltmeter at the panel or with a multimeter actually at the, um, at the battery is probably better. You want to measure what your battery voltage is, and then you connect your boat to shore power, turn on the battery charger, and see if your battery voltage goes up. If your battery voltage goes up with your engine and battery switch turned off, you know that your charger is directly connected to the battery and bypasses, as it should, the engine or house battery switch. It's very important to have your chargers be connected directly and only directly to a battery and not be connected where we were showing on this switch side. Battery chargers cannot be switched, ever, black and white. Otherwise, welcome to the world of magic. Okay? It's a little bit similar to what we were talking about yesterday. What did we say yesterday? We said a good way to test if your bilge pump works and it works unswitched is to actually disconnect, turn your battery switches off and go test your bilge pump, right? Lift the float switch with your battery switches off. That's something we can all do on our boat. You want to confirm that your bilge pumps work even when the battery switches are off. Because if there's a fire, if you leave the boat, whatever you do, you turn that battery switch off, your bilge pumps will still operate. That's really important. And you also want to know that your battery charger is not connected at a switch distribution, but is connected at directly at the battery. All charging circuits on a boat all of them, black and white, there is no debate on this, have to be unswitched. Okay? Every single one. And that's why in this slide, I show all these. This is a charger, 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 charger. And this is simply a few loads. But all of these are charging circuits. And these are all loads. The AC switch on your breaker panel you're going to want to turn that off first because you want to see what the voltage is without it. You know what the house, the house battery voltage is without a battery charger is. The moment you energize a battery charger, you want that voltage to rise. If it doesn't rise, then your battery charger is not connected to that battery. Your battery charger, if a battery charger should always be energized 
like all the time. Would, would that be a fair way to describe that? Yes, I mean, yeah, absolutely. In short, yes. Your battery charger should never, ever, ever not be energized. Honestly, my battery charger on my boat, every time I plug into shore power, my battery charger is always on waiting for AC to come in. There's no reason to not recharge your batteries, unless, of course, you have an old charger that's going to be called not a charger, but a converter, and that converter is going to actually boil your batteries. But if you have a battery charger that's built in the last 20 years, there's no reason for having not maintaining your batteries. Batteries want to be maintained, and the only way to do that is with a battery charger. Yeah, it's a little bit hard to, conceptually, your question is a little bit different. It, it, there's no such thing as a battery charging you that the battery is fully charged. You're looking for an effect of change. A battery charger is not going to indicate if something is on or off. There's no sort of state, you know, it's not like that. It's, you're looking for a change of voltage. There's no such thing as a nominal good voltage. It's all about a change of voltage. Think about the example of a swimming pool. I used that last week with someone else. You could have a huge pipe coming into a swimming pool, and that swimming pool is an Olympic swimming pool. It could be literally a pipe the size of a meter wide. There can be flow into the swimming pool, and yet the swimming pool is not full, right? You could literally have the tap on, it's literally an aqueduct coming into a swimming pool, and it's not to say that until the pool is full, you didn't have flow. You can't. It's about to change. The pool was dry or the pool was at X level and suddenly the level is rising. A change of level rising is an indication that a charger is working. But you will never ever, and this is a good, this is a really good question because I get this all the time in the summer. All the time. People worry, and, they, and, and as we should, but they say, Jeff, I just turned on my alternators and my batteries are not at 14.4. My alternator is broken. Or I turned on my battery charger and suddenly my batteries are not at 14.4 volts. And I'm like, okay, all right, let's, let's talk about this. What was your battery voltage prior to starting? How big is your battery bank? And do you expect to be able to fill a swimming pool instantly of water, regardless of size of the pipe going in and the size of the pool? It would be impossible. How could you? Can you fill a lake in an instant? There's no such thing. The only way you could do that is literally if you have a bucket and you have a glass and you take a bucket and you pour literally a bucket into a glass. But I can tell you that all of our alternators and chargers are a tiny fraction of the battery bank size. Remember what I said yesterday? I said battery chargers are minimum of 10% of capacity. How long is it going to take for something that charges at 10% of capacity to recharge a battery bank? That's a long time, right? If you've got something that is 100 amp hours and your charger is 10 amps, 10 amps into 100, you won't see a full battery instantly. It's going to take hours, literally hours. And the more depleted your battery bank is, the longer it takes for you to get to that. So it's a great question because it, it clarifies this nuance between on or off. Battery chargers, alternators don't turn on and suddenly actually have a full battery. You might see a change, but it will take time for that battery to get completely full. And that's different than a car, because in a car, our batteries are tiny and the alternators are much bigger. That's why the suddenly, as soon as you start your car, your voltage is at 14.4. Because let's say, for example, in the Sprinter, in one of our service vehicles, it's like a 300 or 250 amp alternator on a battery that is 100 amps hour. Of course, as soon as you start that engine, the battery's at 14.4. But on our boats, all of our boats, think about how big is our alternators as a function of our battery bank size. They're fractions. And so when troubleshooting a battery charger or an alternator, there's no such thing as knowing instantly, there's no number you're looking for other than a change. It's sort of like, I'm trying to lose weight right now. I can tell you that I've been at it and it didn't happen overnight. I'm working on it, but it's a slow, gradual change. And it's the same thing with your alternator or your charger. It's about a change, not anything sudden. Does that make sense? Excellent question. In short, you always want to recharge your batteries, always. Batteries don't want to be left in a state of discharge if you can. In short, you, now. Now's the time to charge your batteries, always. Flooded lead acid batteries, AGM lead acid batteries, gel lead acid batteries, all don't want to be in a state of discharge if possible.
You're causing, and left in a, in a not permanent, but a long state of discharge, they're gonna sulfate. And so that's why, for example, if you have a battery charger, you wanna leave it on all the time, and you want your batteries to be on a battery charger 24 seven, always, unless you're away from the dock and you're boating. And it, you don't have to do it, but then you're gonna have shorter battery life if you don't. You know, people that leave their boats in hangars, for example, and that happens a lot, right? Tons of people do it, tons. Happens all, like tons of people do it. And then have their boats in the hangar and don't have a battery charger on, even if they disconnect the loads to the battery or damaging their batteries. You cannot have a battery unconnected to anything, literally disconnected to anything and not getting a charge for six months. You can do it, of course you can, but you're gonna damage your batteries. You're absolutely damaging your batteries. Batteries want to constantly get a charge every day. They want to be flow charged forever. They do not want to be on their own without a charge. And if you don't do it, you can do it all the time. You can leave them in a hangar for six months. You can disconnect all the leads from it. But when you get back to that boat in six months, your batteries are going to be about 50% of capacity over six months. And you're going to have probably worn the batteries down by half their life for the first time you do it. And then the second year you do it, another half. And then your batteries, instead of lasting you five to seven years, are gonna last you two to three years. The question is, when you're connected to shore power, do you have to have your battery switch on all to recharge your batteries? The answer should be no, absolutely no, because the switch should have nothing to do where your battery charger is connected to. Battery chargers have either single output, dual output, three output. This battery charger has two outputs. It's connected at the same time to an engine battery and a house battery. You don't choose if it's connected to one or the other. It's connected to both. And so you, regardless of where your switch is, that battery charger is going to be charging your engine battery and your house battery. Even if both battery switches are on or off, the battery switches could be, they could disappear. You could remove them. The battery switch is here. It's, it's after the charger. So it doesn't matter. I'll take offline, Danielle, and we'll talk about it, but battery chargers bypass switches. Now, if you have a single output inverter charger, for example, and you want to share with another battery, then yes, you might put the battery switch on to combine, but combine is different than on or off. That's forcing this battery and this battery to be in permanent parallel. But you should not have just an inverter charger. You should have an ACR. We talked about that yesterday. Yeah, the question is, another question is, let's say my, my battery charger is switched. I've come to realize that. How do I solve that problem? Well, if, and this is a big if, if your battery charger is right now on this post, which is the switch side, if you move it, you could just move it onto that post and it would become unswitched, right? And that's the thing too with electrical. Remember, it's like a little bit, I give that analogy all the time. Moving a decimal point on a number doesn't seem like a big deal if you didn't understand what it means, right? Like really, I mean, moved it to the left one digit, move it to the right one digit, that's a factor of 10, right? Like your paycheck goes from $100 to $1,000, or opposite, right? It goes from $100 to 10. It makes a big difference where that little decimal is, right? And with batteries and electrical system, moving a wire from one location to another location that could be two inches apart is a world of difference. And so if your battery charger is connected on that battery switch post right here, moving it two inches to this side will solve that problem. But where is it? Your battery could charger could be connected at the panel. Who knows where they connected it? Don't know. You got to look for it. Battery chargers are meant for all batteries. We often install inverter chargers on boat and we'll have what's called an auxiliary charger to handle engine batteries. Like some boats have two engines, three engines, port engine, starboard engine, generator. Those are all engines. They've got to have a battery charger. Absolutely. When sizing a battery charger, right, you generally only think about the deep cycle aspect of the battery that's going to be really demanding. But no, all all batteries want to stay on a charger. Here's another caveat. You see this all the time. People have a boat with a generator. So it was an expensive boat. If you have a generator on board, it's not inexpensive. And the manufacturer most likely did not install a charger on that generator battery. But you know what they did instead? 
Somewhere buried in the manual, they said that you should run your generator at least once a month. Once a month. Now that sounds really doable when you love your boat and the boat is new to you and you say to yourself, hey, you know what, I'm going to come down to the boat every month and I'm going to run the generator always and I will never forget because I love her so much. I'm so excited. Of course, I'm going to do my ritual. How often do people are able to do that and follow through every month forever? I mean, forever. And they better do it. And if they don't, then that battery is going to drain. And is running your engine once a month enough for a battery? No, it wants to be on a charger 24-7. So even then you're compromising your generator battery. One of the most popular things that we do in our shop, as soon as I see a generator, I can guarantee you 95% of generators do not have a battery charger connected to it. Why? Because the manufacturer of the boat was trying to cut corners, and somewhere buried in that manual is run the generator if you want to recharge the battery. And so we end up putting a battery charger for the generator battery. And on some boats, they have two generators. Some boats have three generators. And so we'll put a generator battery charger and we'll have multiple leads going to all those battery banks. Because there's nothing more sacred than a generator battery. That is your get out of jail card. There's no amount. People say, oh, it doesn't matter. I'm like, no, 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 you don't understand. We're in an open conflict. It does matter. Your generator battery is that trump card that gets you out of jail. You start your generator, you have no more problems on your boat because now power is flowing. And so you keep that generator battery always beautifully topped off because that's the one thing that when everything else fails on your boat, suddenly you start the generator, your chargers work, and all the rest of your batteries can get a charge. Next, inverter chargers. So inverter chargers are both a push-pull, right? If you think about old chargers used to be converters, and you think, I mean, it sounds pretty similar, but opposite, invert, convert, right? They sound like opposite. An inverter charger is an inverter converter. That's basically what it is. So it does two things. An inverter can either pull DC power to make AC, or it can pull AC to make DC. Right? Current can go bo both directions. Right? It depends on the situation. When you're away from shore power or a generator, your inverter charger is going to become an inverter only because you're going to pull power from your batteries to create AC. And when you're connected to shore power or you're having a generator, you certainly don't need AC because you're either on a generator or shore. And then you're going to take AC and convert it to make DC. So it's a bi-directional device. Okay? And what I was emphasizing yesterday is for the large part, and remember all rules have exceptions, all rules have exceptions, but 99% of you have an inverter charger with only one single DC positive connection to it. Okay, only one. Inverter chargers are by definition can only be connected to one battery bank. That's it. You're not charging, your inverter charger does not connect to four battery banks. It's not a charger only, it's an inverter charger and since it's only going to have a DC, one DC positive connection to the device. So when troubleshooting an inverter circuit, one of the most popular things that we look for, especially to confirm that it can invert, generally we're troubleshooting inverting first, because that's when people notice there's problems. Most people don't even know to confirm if their battery charger works or not. But I let me tell you, if the microwave doesn't work, or the Nespresso doesn't work, People will definitely know that. First step is you've got to see if this inverter is connected to some sort of DC power, right? Because an inverter can't create AC if it doesn't get DC, right? That would be the first instinct. Before you do that, and a lot of us don't know how to turn an inverter on or off of the remote panel, but that's an essential step. It sounds silly, but a lot of us don't know that. Our inverter charger remote panels have this little button and some of them are, they're buried. Like Magnum, it's easy, it's on off. Xantrax, it's a menu structure. It's not a one button, you have to find it in the menu. You can enable an inverter or you can disable an inverter. And so some instances, clients say, my inverter doesn't work. And what happened is someone was playing with the inverter charger remote panel, disabled the inverter at the remote panel. The inverter doesn't work, but it's not that it doesn't work, it was shut off at the panel. So first step is, can you confirm that your remote panel is on and it's enabled for the inverter? That's obviously the first step. The next step is seeing if 
there's any sort of voltage. Now, if you have a remote panel, if this thing is energized and you have power there, you know that your inverter is obviously working and has DC because otherwise there'd be no light on. There's no way an inverter can show you an indicator light or a panel indicator if there's no power connected to it, right? So that's the first thing. If you can't see anything, then obviously you're questioning why, but if the remote panel is energized and you're not running a generator and or you're not connected to shore power, the inverter is not powered by magic, it's powered by something and therefore the batteries must be connected to it. If it isn't powered and it's a blank screen, now you gotta ask yourself, why is it that I don't have DC power to my inverter? One of the things you gotta look for is this switch right here. It's a little non-discrete switch in between from the house batteries and it's an on-off switch. It could be beside the inverter or it could be near the batteries. And sometimes it's unlabeled, right? You don't know. And that switch has to be on. If it's off, the inverter doesn't get power. The inverter will never work because it's not connected to the batteries. If you have an inverter on your boat and you ask of it more than it's rated for, let's say you have a 2000 watt inverter and for whatever reason you load 3000 watt on that inverter, the inverter will not just do will not stop at 2,000 watt trying to invert. It will try to do everything you ask of it. It has no ability to stop itself from trying to give you 3,000, 5,000, 10,000. It'll do what you ask. The only thing safeguarding the inverter from actually damaging itself because it's being asked to do something it can't is that fuse. So for example, it often happens that people will, disc will tear in their boat over and suddenly lose shore power and they had a bunch of heaters connected. They lose shore power, they had about 40 amps maybe 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 watts of heating on board, electrical heat. They lose their power. The inverter was enabled, but standby. The inverter goes, oh my God, we lost shore power. Let me try to meet demand. The inverter switches internally suddenly from bypass to invert, and it tries to run 5,000 watts of load, and this fuse blows. So if you lost shore power when you were at the dock, let's say, and suddenly you lost power and then you also lost your inverter, it's because you asked the inverter to do something it couldn't do and the fuse, which is called a class T fuse right here, blew. And that's why everyone should always carry a spare class T fuse if they have an inverter charger. Always. Class T, class tango. Like classroom, class T fuse. Find your fuse for your inverter charger whatever it is, and buy another one. Do you think I have one on my boat or do I have two? Three. I have a lot. Because when I go boating, you know what I want to do? I want to go boating. The last thing I want to do is worry about my boat electrical system letting me down. So I all, I'm a boy scout. I'm always prepared. The amount of spares I have on my boat, it's amazing. It's incredible. I'm ready for anything. Because in the middle of nowhere, why would you want to ruin your trip for a fuse? I mean, come on. And you can't find all those in the middle of nowhere in a channelry. You're not going to go to one of those places that barely has milk and maybe they have mustard on the shelf. And you're like, hey, you know, I'm looking for a Class C, about 350 amps. You have one in the back shelf. They're like, who are you? What are you talking about? Are you kidding me? There's no way. You got to go into town for that. Oh, where's town? Oh, well, it's, uh, you know, a couple of days this way. And you're like, Crap. Class C fuse. Find out your inverter fuse and if you ever overload your inverter suddenly because you lost shore power or you were running the generator and you switched, you'll probably end up blowing that fuse. And remember, this is a big gotcha. Inverter chargers are not just inverters. They're also chargers. You lose your inverter, ah, you know what? You can live without an espresso. Maybe. But you can't live without a battery charger. You just can't. You just can't. That means you'd have to run your whole boat through alternator all the time. Being connected to shore power or running your generator is irrelevant. That means now your alternator is the only sole source of power for your boat. And remember when I asked earlier, who doesn't have a battery charger on their boat and nobody lift up their hands? That's how essential a battery charger is. If it wasn't essential, some of us would lift up our hands. Some, more than one or two. A lot of us say, well, a battery charger is not that important. Battery chargers are incredibly important 
And when you lose an inverter charger not working, your trip is done. It's done. It's over. It's, 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 you're done. Because an alternator will have to run forever to meet the loads. You'd have to do circles around islands. You'd be like, well, let's go. We're going to stay here, but we're going to motor eight hours a day every day to repower our batteries because it's just not enough. You know, in most cases, it's just not enough. And so that's why you can't even be at the dock. You can't even go to anywhere. Like I've had a client once, they had to come to the dock, they left the boat, they went in a hotel room until the technician came and replaced the inverted charger. Because you can't stay on board. What are you going to run the alternators at the dock? You know, eight hours a day at idle? And we know that idle is not enough for an alternate output. So what, you're going to start running your boat eight hours a day at cruising RPM to go nowhere so you can recharge your batteries? Not going to happen. It's done. Your boating trip is over. So don't have your boating trip be canceled because you're missing a class T fuse. The question is, is it better to have a backup charger and inverter? Of course, yeah, but then there's a problem of space and cost. Yeah, we do that all the time. When I get to about a 50-footer trawler, 42, depends on how sort of far they go, I love having an inverter charger and having an auxiliary charger that has three outputs. And one of those outputs is a backup to the house let's say a 40 amp, and I have it as a backup on a thermal circuit breaker that's off. I did that on a the Fever 49 recently, and it's right there just waiting. And so if he ever loses that inverter charger, he can run his boat 40 amps and is no problem. It's more than he'll ever run his boat on. 40 amps for 24 hours is, what is that? That's almost 1,000 amp hours. He'll never run through 1,000 amp hours a day. There's more power than he'll ever need. It's not enough to recharge a battery bank quickly, but enough to be connected at shore and run your loads. And so we always, we encourage... That's why I'm not a big fan of having one single inverter charger. Like I wasn't a big fan of having just one bus for all your networking. I like redundancy. You know, it's, I don't know, maybe is, was I like that before being an engineer or I'm like that because of an engineer? I don't know, but I just don't like to have all my eggs in one basket. So, um, yeah, having an inverter charger, single output, make sure that that fuse hasn't blown. And remember, you can actually troubleshoot a class T fuse, and the only way to know if it's blue or not is with one of this. I had a client that didn't have one of those, had to end up leaving the dock, didn't know, left the anchorage, went all the way back to another, like a marina that actually had a class T fuse, two days of motoring, two days of motoring, not like two hours a day, like eight hours a day to get to a place where he could buy a Class T, in the end it had nothing to do with the Class T. You know why he didn't know? Because he didn't have a voltage, a digital voltmeter. Couldn't test it. So if you don't have a digital voltmeter on your boat, honestly, this is not a make-feel-good present. Whatever you do, you need to have one. Because if you don't know how to operate it, at least you can be told on the phone how to operate it by a friend, by a technician, your service provider, someone. But you've got to have a digital voltmeter on board. Question. Correct. Yeah, the question was, if you have an inverter and you have a generator, your generator would still feed your AC panel. Yes, your generator would still feed your AC panel. Even with the inverter down. Even with the inverter down. But the problem is, without a charger, your DC panel, which is most of your loads on your boat, your lights, your water pump, right, your fridge in some cases. Some fridges are AC, DC, but some fridges are DC only, are not going to be powered. Eventually, the batteries are going to drain themselves. How big is a battery charger? Uh, a battery charger, a 40 amp battery charger is about a newer one, right? Not like, you know, 40 years old, 20 year old charger, this big, this wide, about this thick. Yeah, so it could have one anyway. Okay, it's not, it's not that big. Um, they would generally be near the batteries, generally near the batteries. Now that's a 40 amp, a 100 amp charger is about this big, this big, and about this wide almost the size of an inverter. Not as big as an inverter, but pretty damn close. Pretty damn close. Do you sell those? Inverter chargers? Char no, oh yeah, chargers? Just the charger. Oh yeah, absolutely, yeah, we sell everything. Yeah, 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 all this stuff, yeah. Yeah, the question is do I sell chargers, yes. Chargers, I mean, like we have a huge warehouse with tons of stuff, I mean, you have to. But yeah, chargers are readily available. Pro Mariner, you know, we talked about that yesterday. Xantrax, uh, Mastervolt, Victron, I mean there's, as long as it's a name that you've heard more than once, right? If you've never heard of something, that's a little weird. And if nobody's ever heard about it, then that's really weird. You know, go with something. And again, it's not to say their product's not good, but 
this is an important piece of equipment. It's like being on a, you know, it's like being on a, on a machine, I don't know, in a hospital, the perforator or something, and you're like, it's a piece of equipment that you've never heard about before. This is the heart of your boat. Your batteries, if they don't get a charge, you're done. Like, it's, it's game over. Like, your trip is, you can't boat without batteries. If we could boat without batteries, a lot of boats would be a lot happier, <laughs> right? Because this is not easy, okay? Now, remember, we were looking at the DC side, but what about actually having the AC not coming into this to actually charge the batteries? That can happen too, because remember, this is not just an inverter. The inverter DC goes this way when, it's, when you're looking at inverting, but when you're actually charging, it starts from here going that way, right? So it's like this for inverting, and it's like this for charging. So when you're now talking about my charger of my inverter doesn't charge, it's very similar to a charger. Is your source selector switch at the right place? Is your AC double pole breaker on? Is your inverter charger breaker on? And that's the confusing part I was saying last night or yesterday. How many times do I come on a boat and I see an inverter breaker off and it's literally off of the breaker panel. They're like, oh, I don't need my inverter. I'm connected to shore power. It sounds normal to me. It's absolutely right. They're, that statement is 100% accurate. The problem is the label is actually not really the right label. It's an inverter forward slash charger. And that label is extremely rare. I see that maybe once out of 100. So it's a code word. It's an inverter and a charger, but the owner read the label. You can't blame the owner. It's an inverter. I'm connected to shore power. I don't need an inverter. Turn the inverter off. But they don't realize it's an inverter charger. And if you turn the breaker off to the AC feeding the inverter charger, your charger will never work because without AC, a charger not, cannot create DC, right? You can't go without an input and create an output, right? Everything has to have an input. So without AC coming into an inverter charger, you will never ever have a charger work. Could you have shore power go directly to an inverter charger and then go to an AC panel? Yes, you could. Unusual wiring, but yes, possible. In high-end boats, people that don't want to want extreme simplicity, we're gonna end up putting a very large inverter in line between the panel and the shore power. It'd be like a Victron Quattro, but that is extremely unusual. Extremely unusual. There are tons of pitfalls of going that way. It's not that straightforward. Very unusual. And generally when it's done, people didn't understand what they were doing and there's a lot of pain. A lot of pain. Remember that manual I was telling you about, the inverter charger remote panel, uh, the, pa the manual, it's 100 pages? There's no way a man's gonna read that. So there's no way. It's almost a joke. And that's the reason why electronics manufacturers don't even print manuals anymore. Honestly, most people don't miss them. <laughs> you don't read them. Hey, before I remember when I had my C80 or E80 uh, chart plotter, the manual was almost, can you imagine how much it costs to print a small production manual, 20,000 units? Like literally that is 200 pages in color? It must be crazy. I mean, what is that? Like it's gotta be over 100, 200, $300 to print that manual. It must be insane. And the manufacturers realize how many men are gonna read that? 1%? There's no way. They don't even bother anymore. There is simply no more manuals with any pieces of electronic equipment. You wanna read the manual? Now it's on the device. So it means the device has to be on to read the manual because if it's not on, or go online and print it for yourself. And honestly, it's very rare that I get an owner asking me where the manual is. They don't even have bother asking. They're just sort of just start playing. And that's the problem with inverter chargers, is they just start wiring them in without reading the manual. And hence, I make a really good living fixing other people's mistakes. <laughs> it's, it's really that what it comes down to that. So inverter chargers, big takeaway, know how to turn an inverter charger on and off at your panel. You should know that now. If you don't, you want to be curious because one day someone is going to muck around. It might be your nephew, uh, a friend, a know-it-all, uh, yourself. You know, I've got clients all, all the time falling on their sword. They're like, you know what, Jeff? I played around. The wife was telling me I shouldn't have done it. I don't know what I did, but come and help. 
and at least they're honest. And for those, I have super amounts of sympathy. It's the people that say, no, the panel did it all by himself. You know, I've never touched it. And then you go in and all the settings are like completely random. So you're telling me that the panel failed, but it failed arbitrarily at all these wrong settings? Like, I'm like, yeah, it's possible, I guess, but really, I don't think so. So generally, you gotta be careful. I tell this all the time, especially with a lot of sophisticated stuff. Generally, you can't snap your fingers and start back at the beginning of the labyrinth. A lot of times when you go down a journey and you start changing, changing menus and selections, there is no going back. There's not a single point where you're like, hey, you know what, I, whatever I did, just let's go back to the beginning. At that point, you're like, I have no idea what I did. I'm lost. And then it's like, nothing's working. And that happens a lot with double inverters. They're supposed to be stacked, unstacked and then they're not working, and then people are freaking out, it's because they went into the menus and they started playing with them, okay? So it happens to all of us, honestly. There's nothing wrong with making mistakes, but try to make sure that you know how to fix them. So go back to your inverter charger remote panels and know how to enable the charger, disable the charger, enable the inverter, and disable the inverter through soft keys on that remote panel. Because that generally is gonna be the first thing to fail.